people get even extraction or e at least even uh, or even yeah. extraction. So we use the chisel, like the Pullman chisel is the one that we use. Uh, it's a redistribution tool, it's height adjustable, so it's really, it's just like really, really easy to use and it's not super staticky. Um, and other things that you can use are, I don't know if you've seen those little like cups. Do you know who makes those cups? What's it called? Decor. Decor. It's like a 70 mil, 70 mil like, yeah, there's like this little tiny uh, Tupperware. We'll have to get a link to it, and it it's got a lip on it, and it fits perfectly into a portafilter basket. So you can dose into the cup and kind of flip your portafilter over on the cup, and it forms a seal. And you can actually do like a you can kind of like shake it to break up clumps if you've got a really clumpy grinder and it just kind of evens everything out or feathers everything out. I have one of those. We don't use it in uh, production because we don't have a particularly clumpy grinder, um, but that's something that works. A lot of the home people use the, the Weiss distribution technique, which is actually like a paper clip or some sort of pin and just kind of stirring the coffee. And a, a friend of mine does that in his commercial cafe and he does it with really great speed and like really great success and they dose from a rover e straight into the border filter they weigh every shot and then they have just like this little paper clip that's been out and they stir each shot to break up every clump so you don't need like super fancy gear if you're just going to go for it but i think if you got like a really good distribution tool a nice tamper and then you don't really need any other doodads. Some of this stuff's like fun to have, you know, because of the nerd factor. You, then you. So if, Hello. Uh, ah. if <laughs> une unevenness is such a problem, why don't you think there's been like advances in grinder technology to just even it out and tamp for the barista? I think that's happening right now. I think so you've got things like the, um, like the puck press that's happening and then I don't know what I'm gonna see this weekend with grinders but I think the real answer is because it's hard and we've had so many grinders for so long that are built off of like a certain model and people are making incremental steps towards things but I don't know and there were a few years ago I remember seeing some grinders that had no exit shoots. So they had like no amount of trapped coffee, but they would spray coffee everywhere. So that was like a really big problem. <laughs> I'd seen grinders that were trying to run cool and they had like PC cooling systems, but then they got too cold and they started developing like moisture content inside them. So I think controlling the dragon is just like a little bit harder, but I think the automated tamping is coming slash here and we'll see what happens at the show. But yes, I want that all. So kind of like the big four steps that you're saying like home baristas yeah. can uh, have control over. How, especially for home baristas, how do you look at that and by tasting espresso without a recipe, figure right. out which one to manipulate? Right, totally. That was a really good question, which was if you take the elements of the big four, like the things that make up that recipe, how do you figure out which one to manipulate by tasting? That's a rough one. So you want to start with some constants. So if I'm dialing in like a new espresso, I'll ask for a spec from whoever makes the espresso. And it might not be perfect, but it's a pretty good starting point. And as a side note, if you are buying coffee from a reputable roaster that you've heard of, and you ask them for an espresso spec, that is probably the best one. Um, which is a conversation that we have sometimes that it's a really kind of hard conversation. So whereas we might have a, a recipe like this and we're like, this is how our flagship blend tastes the best. And maybe someone will pull it and they're like, I really liked it at 16 in, 24 out at 33 seconds. And we're like, that may be so, but that is not how it is supposed to taste. And that definitely doesn't taste optimal right there. So I definitely defer to them first, pull a shot, and then the first thing that you can manipulate easily 
is the time frame, and what's going to be tied directly to the time frame is obviously the output. So you kind of get like a, a two for one. You can't really do one without the other unless you get into adjusting the grind, which is like level two. So time frame plus output would be level one. So I'd say throw it in if that's spec, taste for some sort of extraction byproduct. Say, okay, it's like a little under extracted and I can tell because it's sour or it's tart or it's tangy or it's sour. Before I touch the grind collar at all, I'll just pump a little bit more water through it and by extension do a little bit more time. So I take it to maybe 35 out, 28, 29 seconds, just add a little bit to one side. And that may or may not solve the problem. If it solves the problem, beautiful. You don't have to touch the grind collar, you're good to go. If that doesn't solve the problem, then you're going to have to adjust the grind. And then if you're getting that same thing, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm under extracted, like I'm gonna have to tighten this thing up. And then once you tighten it up, I would stick, because you tighten it up, both of those things are gonna change again. At the same dose, you're going to get a varying output and time frame. I will always pick output as the main flavor driver, all things being close, than time frame. And that's an idea that we use in the cafe too, to where it's like, if this is our perfect recipe, and you have a shot going, and it becomes clear that you're in the window, but you're not going to get 33 out at 27 seconds, maybe you're going to get 33 out at 26 seconds, or you get 35 out at 27 seconds, we'll always take the output before the time frame. So if I did go to phase two, adjust that grind collar, make it a little bit finer, I would do the 19 in, and I would hit the output at whatever time frame I have. And then from there, if that doesn't work, then I would try, again, lengthening the time frame, and you're in the circle. I, it's a little complicated to explain, but that's the gist of it. So we'll always go for grind collar last. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, yeah. Sit. Cool. Any other ideas, thoughts, concerns? Is anybody scared? Maybe two. That's great. There's none, and there's two. You go first. So sometimes when I tamp down, there is a sliver of coffee ground that's still on the side of the water filter. Basket. Does that affect the tag? So she said, sometimes when she tamps, she'll have a little bit of coffee still stuck to the side of the basket. Is that a thing to worry about? And I say, if you're just getting going and you're not really optimizing, I wouldn't let it bother you too much. If it really bugs you, like we use really big oversized tampers. So when we tamp down, there's absolutely no coffee on the side of the basket. And that makes me feel really good. And you know, if you look at the numbers and you plug in the hard science, like you will get more coffee interacting with more water, which is a good thing. But if you're just getting going, I don't think you have to throw away your tamper and automatically spend like 125 bucks on a brand new tamper. Just maximize everything that you can control and then I would go for it. Having that, that being said, like having that coffee stay there is gonna be better than trying to do some of the old ways to get it off, which would be like knocking the porta filter or tapping it down again. I would just leave that rather than do that. And then, you know, in six months, you're like, I'm gonna buy a new tamper. But you'll still be able to get good espresso doing what you're doing. Yeah, it's just, there's a certain diameter of the basket, and most tampers, so like a 58 millimeter basket is usually a little bit bigger than 58 millimeters. So if you use a tamper that's 58 millimeters, there's some extra room in there. So there's only a little bit, you want to get bigger, but not too big. So it's, a, it's a problem. But yeah, you're still making good coffee. I'm just curious, thoughts on single origin espressos? Just comments related to single origin espressos or if using blends, um, the pre-mixed, pre-mixed to roast blends versus post-roast mixed in blends. And that impact on extraction as well. Right. Okay, so, yeah. It's a loaded one. Um, single origin espresso is just like solubility levels by themselves or single origin versus blend. Either one, cool, sweet. So, we'll take post-roast blends versus pre-roast blends first. Um, 
We blend everything post roast, and in my mind, this is really the only way to control your solubility and also your flavors. Um, an example is we've got a coffee that's a Pacamara from Ecuador. Its first crack is relatively early. After the crack happens and there's a little like temperature drop that's associated with first crack, the coffee basically wants to skyrocket through the roof. The bean temp curve like really wants to take off and you have to pull back immense amount of heat in order to keep that happening. And what you end up with is a coffee that's really sweet, but it's at a relatively low temperature and it's also at a relatively low development percentage and compared to something like this other coffee that we have from Colombia, which needs a ton of energy leading up to first crack because it wants to dive bomb, but it also wants to be at a much higher temperature. Its first crack happens a lot later and its overall end temperature and development percentage to get to roughly the same roast level are a lot higher. I can't in my mind imagine putting both of those things in the drum at the same time and optimizing either one. There's some sort of built-in compromise there, no matter what. And then another thing that people talk about is just blends in general, and in general, and you're roasting like three different coffees, you're gonna blend them together and make espresso out of it. And how do you address that? Because different coffees, depending on how they're roasted, will have different levels of solubility. So there's one train of thought that says, there's no way you're going to be able to maximize your extraction or optimize your extraction if you've got three different coffees in a blend, no matter what single origins are always gonna be more predictable. And the logic behind this makes sense, but I think the way to solve it is you need to have this intention when you're at the roaster and whoever's at the roaster needs to understand what's going on at the espresso machine in order to set that up. So we have one espresso that we use for milk-based drinks and that's a three bean blend and they're really different coffees and they're one is a natural coffee, you know, one's a wash coffee from Colombia, one's Brazil, we've got a pulp natural in that. So really, really different coffees. And we're roasting them differently to act well together in concert than we would roast any of those individually as single origins. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the flavor experience that the person's having in the cup. So it's just in awareness and not roasting blindly and be like, okay, cool, I roast the Brazil, I'm gonna throw that in, I roast the Southern Colombian and I'm gonna mix it up and then it's gonna be good. That can definitely lead to like varying levels of extraction. Does that, is that kind of what we were talking about? Sick. Beyond that. Um, and then the, the idea of single origin espresso, and I don't know if this is where you're going and talking about single origin on its own. Everyone here is probably aware of this, but it's a nice little bit of knowledge to kick to your students and especially like home barista kind of people is that with different coffees, you're gonna have different tastes. So there's no like one good idea of what espresso tastes like. Espresso is like a brewing method. You know, your espresso machine is a tool that you use to express like some sort of artistic creativity. Like, I want this to taste like this. I want that to taste like that. So when you have single origin coffees, it's like this amazing way for you to explore this range of menu. And that single origin shot from Kenny Caragoto should absolutely taste different than like the cachoeira that you roasted from Brazil. And I think that's the beauty of SOs. Anything else? I guess feel more. I love it. Um, how do you guys approach brewing decaf espresso that tastes great on its own and also holds up well in milk? It's a really interesting question because it hasn't really been like an issue for us. So we run a single origin decaf, it's a coffee from Yuri Chef, and it's honestly like really chocolatey, really fruity by itself. We pull it to, it's actually that same spec. So we roast it so that it performs like at the same spec as our flagship blend. So it's probably, well, from what I've experienced, it's like a decent size shot compared to like what a lot of people would pull their decaf at. So in the past, I'd always pulled my decaf 
a little bit shorter because I felt it had a little bit less to give, so you'd end up with shots that are like in the mid-20s or like sub-30 because that's where they were the most sweet. And I don't know if now, because we have total control over the roasting process and we can just set it up to do what we want, but we haven't had the issue of weak decaf in milk-based beverages. And our biggest drinks aren't super big. That's the non-answer answer. Such a huge fan, um, so I'm gonna try not to. Am I on? Oh, you're on. I'm so on. I'm gonna try not to be in wrong. Um, but I appreciate your perspective so much. So I'd like to kind of pick your brain about tamping and how much pressure is actually necessary to do construction. What you think about that? Yeah, you don't need like there's not one particular number that's the magic number. The way that we kind of teach it is that we, we just kind of put the, can, the tamper on the counter. And then when we have new trainees, we just have them push on the tamper. And when you're pushing on the counter, you kind of feel two things. Like, you feel that the counter's kind of pushing back at you. you feel this little tension in your arm. And then you can also tell that like, no matter how much you press on it, it's not really going anywhere. So that's the feeling that we look for. So once you're tamping an actual puck of coffee, you'll feel that puck kind of compress and compress and compress. And then at some point, it's going to feel just like the counter did initially. It's going to be pushing back at you a little bit, but there's no reason to rail on it more than that. You want to get a good seal. Yeah, go. So you believe in pressure? I believe in pressure. Yeah. I, I mean, the really, really ultra light or no tamps don't really work because you have that idea of, or you have the potential to get some sort of pitting. Especially depending on like what your water delivery system is. So if you have like a really small needle valve and a really slow and low pre-infusion and you don't have like a huge rush of water, maybe you can get away with hyper light or maybe in theory, if everything's perfect, you can get away with nothing at all, but perfection isn't reality. So if you've got like an old school linea with no restrictors on it and you hit it and you see the water that comes out of that, it's like boom! It's like you need some sort of protection against pitting, which is gonna lead to digging out a part of the puck and you're gonna get uneven extraction. So yeah, I definitely believe in some pressure. Neat. How important is temperature in the, the different types of coffees that you guys brew? I mean, do you have a different temperature at each group head for each coffee? No, we don't. We cheat. We're, we're cheating all the time. And the way that we're cheating, and this is something that Jared and I have kind of been after a long time, is like we control the dragon because we roast all of our coffee. So a huge way that we think about the roasting process is basically we're, si we're roasting coffee to unlock flavor potential, but you're also roasting coffee to determine the solubility level of that coffee. And temperature is obviously like, you know, you increase temperature, you get more extraction, you decrease temperature, you get less extraction. So we talked about having, you know, different temperatures for different group heads and we could have different temperatures for different this, but at the end of the day, we're like, we can probably actually fix this in the roaster. So, I would say that temperature is something more that you would play with if you were maybe a multi-roaster account. You've got coffee from us, and maybe you've got coffee from someone like Hart, where you've got, like, for all intents and purposes, radically different roast levels. I'll use that as like a loose term, and maybe you want a little bit more temperature for something that's a little less developed, a little bit less temperature for something that's more developed. But since we develop on kind of an even plane, we don't actually adjust temperature on the day-to-day. -day. Uh, could you walk us through exactly what you do in your cafe and how you prepare your espresso shots? Like even if what tool you would use at one point, I know you probably don't have it with you, but just walk us through and actually see demonstration, live demonstration. Oh, live demo? Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's ridiculously simple. Um, the, the steps of service are not any different than what you might think. So it's basically your standard barista workflow. I'll just talk about it really quickly. So pour the filter out, 
purge the group bed. So we have a uh, Strata AV. So how we set up the auto volumetric dosing on that is that we have one button that brews our flagship blend. So it's set to do 33 grams out. And then the other button is a purge button. So if you rip the portafilter out, you just hit the purge button and that runs water through the group head for like a second. And that's just your purge. So we have to click on, click off the purge. Just pull it, pop it, and then dry the portafilter out just like you would. And then straight into the grinder. And depending on what's going on, so we'll do like a, we won't do a scale every time for the flagship because the grinders are really, really consistent and it doesn't need it. So we'll do periodic check-ins to where people are double checking the dose, you know. Every 10, 15 minutes, we'll throw one on the scale. Cool, two tenths of a gram window is what we have either way before we need to make an adjustment and we call it good. So pour the filter right in the grinder, pulled right out of the grinder, redistributed with the chisel, tamped in and on, volumetric button is set and it's good to go. It's, we don't settle, we'll just go straight from the grinder, chisel right on top. And we also use a basket that's uh, it's relatively deep. So it's a 22 to 24, is that what it's called? The big Pullman one? Yeah. Um, it's like a, it's a really deep basket. So we don't get any of that compacting issue. If we had like a decent amount of coffee in a really small basket, you might kind of like squish it with the redistribution tool before it actually got to mix it up. So no settling. We found that it works better without any settling. Spin it in, tamp it in and on and go, and then rotating through. So we'll have an extra porta filter. So there's it's a three group bed machine, but we'll have a fourth porta filter. It's kind of the one that's being loaded as the others are extracting. So it kind of works as a rotation. So when the one comes out of the third, it gets knocked right, it can immediately go to dose, and there's already another one loaded that's not in play. So we can kind of continually extract three like doubles at the same time, and that's what that floater porta filter allows. But as far as like actual order of operations, it's really no different than the standard out, purge, clean, dry, dose, redistribute, tamp, in and on. It's just the little tiny automation things that allow us to kind of move really fast and setting up the bar in a way where people don't have to walk a long way to get where they need to be. So we're kind of set up in a corner, so all we have to do is this. Uh-oh. Oh! oh. 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 How did um, I know I think this was gonna happen? Last. I knew that, that was gonna happen. This is like the last question because it's after five, right? Really? You put up a dope hour of information. Um, but I've got a question that may, I may not have heard, it may have been covered, but it, it's in regards to the two La Marzocca Strata AVs you have in shop and how one is it used to extract a different preparation of coffee. Could you possibly explain that? Because I know it's fascinating to everybody I know that comes walking through that little bohemian burg y'all be residing in, but perhaps you could blow our minds with the origin story on why a coffee shot, a long black, a something, that beautiful La Marzocca Strada is used to prepare, bam. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. so I was, uh, I was out in front of the convention center with Charles and I was like, I was like, I've been to this convention center more times than I could ever imagine. And then I thought about the time that we drove to Seattle to pick up the Linea from the, or the GB5, to throw in the back of the, that was tripping me out, man. I was like, dang, that was a long haul. We drove 14 hours to get an espresso machine for this guy, it's tough. Yeah, dude, you know, guns, it's cool. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we have two espresso machines in store. One is for extracting espresso in that way that you might think. And then the other one will do brewed coffee on it or a coffee shot, whatever you want to call it. Um, the machine's set up at basically three to three and a half bars of pressure. We run, again, a really deep basket in there. We grind off the EK43. We're calibrating for espresso. Our grind setting is three and a half. That probably won't work for you, but I'll just let you share that. Um, that one's interesting because we will dose that coffee, redistribute it, but since the pressure is so low, we don't actually tamp that one. We go in and on. And brew time is about 60 to 70 seconds, depending on the coffee. And we get our brewed coffee by the cup, and we can have it to customers in under two minutes. And a lot of people are confused when they come in. They're like, what's up with that espresso? It looks weird. 
and the way that we really think about it is not as an espresso machine, it's just a really convenient water delivery device. So it's not really quite a pour over, but it's definitely not espresso, and it's just a really nice way to brew coffee. And Ben Kaminsky had been doing that for a while, and I know Matt did it for a little bit too, so we talked with Ben last year, because I see something new and I'm like, nah, that won't work, that's stupid. Um, right, so I asked him, I was like, yeah, and I was like, ah, it seems weird. So I was like, dude, shoot me straight, I've known you for a long time, is this BS or not? And he's like, no, I've had really beautiful coffee, some of the most amazing coffees that I've had in my entire life. So we tried it out, Jared and I played with it, and we came up with a recipe, and it works really, really, really well. And the coffee tastes nice, which is great. People love it, they say it's awesome, but for us, the real win is the convenience and the speed of service. Someone orders a buy the cup coffee and some sort of espresso beverage, nine out of 10 times their buy the cup gets there first, which is almost unheard of in like the pour over driven, like buy the cup world of specialty coffee. So. I might want to buy two espresso machines. I don't know. You could do it. You could do it now. We got two more coming in the new shop. ABABR. Did I get one more question and then we go? Yeah. One more? Do you use paper filters with that? No, we don't. We have. Uh, we just run it straight out of the basket. So we did play with the uh, like AeroPress filter in the bottom. But we actually like the one straight out of the porta filter a little bit more. And there is like the teeniest, tiniest bit of sediment, but it's not as much as you might think, and the weight of the coffee is really, it's really nice to it. Cool. Scott, am I like, tell me what to do, bro. I got you. You're good, you're gonna wind me out of this thing? Yes, thank you. Let's hear it for vodka. <laughs> thank you so much, man. Dropping some knowledge on us, really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you guys all for coming to the first day of Welcome Home. We have programming all week here, uh, so you can come check it out. We got the schedule in the back. Tomorrow we have uh, some roast profiles from Akawa. If you, if you haven't seen that little roaster that they have, it's like a little sample roaster that they now are offering for the home, uh, you should come and check that out. They're going to be showing how different profiles affect taste and doing some experiments with that. Um, and then we also have uh, Joe and Meister doing their Opposites Extract podcast live here on this stage tomorrow. So there is a whole lot of fun stuff happening. So uh, tell your friends, come on back by uh, and check us out tomorrow. And thank you so much for coming and happy coffee week to all of you. Thank you. Cool.